This presentation by Dr. Jennifer Tucker with the University of Georgia is part of the Spring 2021 Beef Cattle Production Series organized by Fort Valley State University, Dr. Nikki Whitley and Stefan Price with AgriUnity LLC, Mr. Handy Kennedy. Um, so thank you all. Uh, I, I really appreciate getting the opportunity to speak with you. As he said, I do uh, beef nutrition and forage management work down here at the Tifton campus. So I am in South Georgia in predominantly Bermuda grass, Bahia grass country. And I wanted to take a little bit of a different approach tonight. So we're going to talk a little bit about getting started with managed grazing, the benefits of managed grazing, and then some newer technologies that are available uh, that a lot of us aren't aware of or know of that we've been trying to implement uh, down here in Tifton. And so hopefully I won't bore you too much <laughs> with this information, uh, but, you know, grazing management is kind of my thing. I really enjoy uh, this part. Uh, before we do anything in managed grazing, the first thing we have to do is develop a grazing management plan. And so what I've done here is just taken a screenshot of our family farm in Kentucky and you can do this with Google Earth or anything of that nature. And in the first picture here, I've just outlined what is our perimeter. Uh, you want to make sure anytime you, you have any type of land that you have a good perimeter fence and you know where those perimeter areas are. And then anything that goes on inside that perimeter can be flexible. Uh, so what I always recommend is you, you kind of get that overall view. Uh, and then you go in and you put your permanent fence lines that you don't plan to change and any watering sources. And at this point, now you get to play around and determine where you would put fencing or what rotations you can identify, what grasses you have, and really start to map out a grazing management plan. So why do we even wanna worry about grazing management or why is it, it, it I guess, important for us to manage uh, our grazing? Uh, obviously, because we have goals in animal production operations. We want to improve our grazing efficiency and reduce that pasture waste. So we want to be more efficient uh, with our forages and, and that resource that we have available to us. We also want to be able to conserve our surplus forage, which could be hay or silage or baleage, uh, for those times of years when we don't have uh, active forage growing and we need to provide some type of forage uh, for our animals. With, by improving our grazing management, we can also improve our animal performance uh, which then will improve our forage quality at the time of use. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of targeting these goals as we're looking at our grazing management. We also have objectives. And so it's a little bit different when we're looking at our goals versus our objectives. And our objectives are to manage our pasture and our other feed inputs to efficiently produce our animal product. All right, because we want to be as efficient as we can, because then that's how we're going to uh, be as economic as we can with this uh, with this entity, and, and let's let's face it, the economics are, are what it comes down to. We also want to effectively manage our forage quantity as well as our quality over the grazing season, regardless of what grazing method that we're utilizing. And we know that these methods are going to adjust throughout the growing season based on the forage that we're having and using. We also want to adjust our stocking rates to improve our grazing uh, efficiency and the animal product that's produced per unit of land. And this again, fluctuates throughout the season depending on the forages that we're utilizing. When we think about grazing uh, in our pastures and we're looking out and really it's regardless of what you're grazing, uh, this is kind of just a simple uh, diagram, but we have our grass and you see we have our grass above the ground and we have our roots below the ground. And once our grasses get into active growth and we start to graze those grasses, uh, we go through and we start to remove that top material. Once we remove that top material, what happens to the material below the, below the ground? So as our regrowth of our top material begins, our roots will die back. So if we think about our forages, what's on top or what we can see above the ground is really representative of what happens below the ground. So when we graze all the way down to the ground, we're really having a negative impact on those roots and the survivability of that forage pasture. Now, if we have just the small amount of material on the top and then we go back and we graze or cut that area again, then our roots are gonna die back even more. Now, this is what happens in a continuously grazed system or when we aren't trying to allow that rest and that recovery time period. 
However, instead, if we pull the animal off of that area and we allow that plant to get adequate rest, we see that those roots start to grow back, that top material starts to grow back. And now we've created a better cycle where we get that regrowth and we allow that rest and that recovery. And this is achieved by utilizing grazing management. Another thing we can think about is what else are we benefiting by not grazing or not managing our grazing? So if you can see on this small little box here, uh, this is our forage and it's been cut pretty short continuously over time. So you can see that there's not a lot of root mass below that forage. Now, what else do we have in the field but what we call opportunistic pesky plants? And these opportunistic pesky plants like the same things that our forage plants do, except that the animals don't tend to like them as much. So they're not going to get continually grazed or selected, and so they're allowed to continue to grow. Well, as what grows on top, we think about what's happening below the ground. All right, so now we have created an environment where we are already competing for the nutrients that we apply, because even if we're applying fertilizer, now in this situation, are we fertilizing our forage? Are we fertilizing our stronger uh, weeds that happen to be in that field? And I'll, not only are we competing below the ground, but we're also competing for that sunlight and that rain or that moisture that are all needed for that forage growth. So if we can allow adequate rest and recovery, we're now allowing our forages to have a better chance at competing with those other plants that the animals may not choose to graze. So we need to remember that proper height and rest are the key to grazing success. Most plants are grazed every two to seven days. Okay, so if you can see in this picture, we have a continuously grazed system. The reality is animals are gonna choose the new growth over the more mature. So that's why we see these highs and these low areas uh, within a pasture area, okay? Because as this continues to grow and gets more mature and this starts to regrow, well, that's like eating that brand new ice cream versus something over here that we've just kind of left over in the corner, okay? So we want to be sure that we're trying to limit that. And by doing that, we utilize rotational grazing. And with rotational grazing, you're allowing those plants to rest you're also putting greater pressure on the plant area for a shorter period of time. So we get more of that uniform grazing. So we don't end up with these highs and lows in our pastures. So when we look at our different forage species, uh, not all rest periods are created equal. And this is, uh, we, we can think about this at any time of the year, but it's definitely related to the weather. So in cooler weather, our cooler season grasses can have a shorter rest period. Uh, so right now, I know a lot of people are starting to turn out onto annual ryegrass. So annual ryegrass or tall fescue, you want to allow that to rest for 10 to 14 days, and then you can get back on into that field. So if you have uh, one fescue pasture and you cut it into two or four sections, uh, and we'll talk about how to, how to separate that in a little bit, uh, then you can allow a week to two weeks of grazing within a section and get that higher quality forage and allow that rest and recovery of that forage. So you're really extending that grazing season. Now, when we get into the summer months, uh, we see that especially with tall fescue, our animals kind of self-limit themselves. And that's on Kentucky 31 tall fescue, and that's due to an endophyte that's in that plant. But if your tall fescue doesn't have that endophyte, if it's a novel or an endophyte-free variety, uh, animals aren't gonna self-limit themselves. And so that's why we see a lot of tall fescue uh, start to get overgrazed and, and start to decrease in the middle of the summer months. Uh, when you get into the summer months, though, that's when our Bermuda grass, our Bahia grass, or Dallas grass really starts to thrive and grow. And so now we can start with a seven to 14 or, or a two or three week rotation on those forages. So that's where you kind of got to figure out what your rotation is based on the forage that you're using. So when we talk about our grazing systems, we have different uh, grazing systems here and the most common is gonna be continuous stocking and it's gonna be the least efficient option. And I'm gonna go through these real quick on a basis of efficiency and then we'll go through what they are specifically. And don't worry, I'm not gonna cover every grazing method out there. There's way too many of those. 
Uh, so continuous stocking is going to be our least efficient. It's about 30 to 40 percent efficiency or efficient utilization of that forage. So um, out of all of the grass out there, you're only getting about 30 to 40 percent of that forage effectively uh, grazed by, with that system. With a slow rotation where you have three or four paddocks, you're increasing that efficiency to a utilization of 50 to 60 percent of that forage that's in the field. With a moderate rotation, so we would say taking one paddock and turning it into six or eight paddocks, you increase to 60 or 70 percent, but you also, every time you increase the number of paddocks, think about increasing the number or how quickly you are moving uh, those animals. So you go from moving maybe once a week uh, to once every three days or, or even sooner than that. And then our most efficient is going to be strip grazing. Now, strip grazing is where you allow no more than two to three days worth of forage at a time, and you graze on a strip, and then you continue to move, uh, move through that. But that is going to give you the highest utilization and the highest efficiency of that forage. Um, so when we talk about the difference of continuous versus rotational, because really that's what we're trying to move away from, it's at least implementing some type of rotational methodology. And we can look at some of this uh, research that was published, and they were looking at uh, multiple locations, but here they had 12 paddocks and they rotated every two days. And while you don't see the benefit in cow weight or individual animal performance, the big benefit of moving to a rotational system uh, from a continuous system, and this was on uh, in the fight free tall fescues in common Bermuda grass. Uh, but when you move into that situation, you can see that you can increase your stocking rate. All right, so your cow calf units per acre, you can have more animals on the same unit of land because you're becoming more efficient in the utilization of that forage. We also see that there is an increase in the total calf gain or pounds per acre, which is directly related to the fact that you can have higher stocking. Uh, so the benefit here is, again, you don't see that individual animal, but now you have more animals, which translates to more pounds, less hay that has to be fed uh, per animal, and then more pounds equal more dollars, which is uh, our overall goal in, in you know, beef production operations. Uh, then looking at this, this is just uh, some different projects throughout uh, the around the south and that region where uh, they increased, uh, they saw an increase in the gain per acre in rotational compared to continuous grazing and all of these research studies by switching from a continuous to a rotational system, we did see a significant increase and, and we actually have some projects here uh, at UGA where we are utilizing uh, both weekly rotations as well as um, stockpile, so daily rotations or every two to three day rotations, and you really start to see that benefit. Uh, it's really nice to see that like in front of you where you can see the forage regrowing while you're going on to another paddock. Uh, it's a really good visual. All right, so what are we talking about with these methods? And I'll go through these pretty quickly, uh, but I do have a slide in here that has kind of the details after I describe each one of those. I do believe that uh, Dr. Whitley has asked for a copy of the slide set. So uh, if you all want that after this meeting, uh, feel free to ask for that. All right, so continuous stocking. Uh, essentially, you allow the animals free reign of a pasture. You put them in there and you, you let them graze uh, and they get the selectivity that they choose. They get to choose the high spots, the low spots, the most vegetated material, depending on your stocking rate. If you're not overstocked, uh, that's when you really start to see those individual animals stand out. You will have some animals that just gain, um, you know, just, just like gangbusters. I mean, they just continue to grow. Um, but then you also have some that kind of don't do so well. Uh, but so this one is definitely more beneficial for the individual animal performance. Uh, and it definitely allows for a lot of selectivity in that system. Also going to have the lowest input, okay? And it's the simplest option that we have for grazing. It's going to be the most commonly seen across the Southeast and probably across uh, the nation. So if we move into a rotational stocking system, again, we are now improving our efficiency in the forage utilization, but we also are going to have to increase a little bit of that labor input. Now, for the example here, I have eight paddocks. It does not, eight paddocks is not a requirement. You know, putting a fence down the middle and just going from one side to the other, that's a rotation. Uh, that's what I suggest to a lot of people getting started. You know, put one, you know, split your pasture in half and graze on one side 
for a week and then move to the other side for the week and then start to think about, did I just increase and get two or three more days that I wouldn't have had of grazing uh, if I had used the other option from the year before. In a rotational grazing system, you put in a temporary or permanent paddock splits. You start in one pasture and then you rotate through. And so it would allow uh, a time of rest for this pasture that you come off of. So you don't immediately go back into that. And in this situation, we would have eight moves before we got back to our original pasture. Uh, the number of moves and number of days are very uh, uh, decided or defined by the forage uh, that you are growing and, and the, um, I guess, the number of paddocks that you have. Uh, there definitely is a greater input requirement with a rotational stocking system, uh, but what you start to see is that animals uh, get very used to this. They get used to seeing you. They'll actually want to go ahead and rotate themselves when they start to learn, uh, and so actually we see an improvement in animal behavior uh, because they do have more interaction with uh, individuals than some of our continuous stocking where, you know, we let them go and we check on them from a truck and we go and keep moving forward. Um, rotational systems also are going to help us to improve uh, our pasture management skills uh, and, our, and our overall management systems. Um, the next option is a leader follower system. Now, this can be done with young cows, um, you know, calves, uh, we can, use, we can do this with multi-species grazing. Uh, the idea here is that you let whatever has the highest nutritional need graze through first. And you typically are gonna rotate that a little bit quicker. Um, so in this situation, we have calves, we let them go in, they would get the highest nutrition because uh, we want them to be gaining weight you know, and, and moving forward. So we let them go a little bit ahead of the, the cows and the cows are gonna just be in that maintenance mode. So we're not as concerned about them gaining weight or getting that highest nutritional need. And so that's, again, going to improve our efficiency. Uh, one of the ways that I always kind of laugh about, we talk about creek grazing would be kind of an effective way of, of doing this. Um, but a lot of people talk about the calves never stay in a temporary fencing technology area, um, you know, that the fence just doesn't keep them out because they run right under it. Well, you know, we just would call that leader follower grazing. So they're just <laughs> self-leading them into that, uh, that area and getting that better nutritional requirement. Again, this is going to have a higher labor labor need or labor input, um, but you know it's, it kind of helps you better efficiently utilize those forages. Uh, and then the most efficient is going to be the strip grazing. Now, again, in strip grazing, uh, we allow just a small area, so no more than two to three days worth of forage at a time. Uh, you can do this with uh, temporary fencing. It's going to be the most effective way to strip graze. Uh, and we usually, usually recommend, recommend strip grazing for either annual forages, uh, like annual ryegrass, um, or for stockpiling, uh, tall fescue or Bermuda grass, or any of the stockpiling technologies. Now, in this system, you allow them two to three days worth of forage. You move them into the next section, and they continue to graze through, and then they come back to that beginning strip. Um, if we are in a stockpile situation, and this area will not be in active regrowth, uh, it's a little bit easier from a management standpoint because you're not worried about moving the cows. You're just worried about moving the fence up every uh, two to three days. Um, if you do have a forage that's going to actively regrow, you want to make sure that you have that back fence to keep them out of there. Uh, the biggest limitation to this system is water uh, because how do you get that water uh, into each of those strips, um, or how do we have a uniform location uh, for water? And I'm going to address some of that in just a little bit. So strip grazing, again, is going to be our most efficient grazing method. Um, it's commonly used with our annual grasses, but it's a very high labor requirement. Okay, so I wanted to switch focus a little bit because you can't implement any of these grazing management techniques no matter what forage you're using uh, if we don't uh, in, include some of these technologies that are going to help us do this. And obviously, you can't split a paddock without having a fence. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit of just about some fencing technologies. And the first thing is I don't want anybody going out and replacing all of their fence and putting brand new fencing everywhere. Uh, that's expensive and it's, you know, that's just, that's not, that's crazy to think about doing. So you got to think about what you have 
start with what you have. And this is very uh, common for South Georgia pastures. I actually took these on uh, some of our research farms, you know, having barbed wire and some T-post uh, and then, you know, having a woven wire fence and wooden, wooden posts. These are pretty common to see, um, but these are not electric. Uh, and for us to be able to do effective grazing uh, with rotational systems, a lot of times we're gonna need to look at uh, using some of that electric fencing technology. Uh, but you can improve on what it is that you have with just a little bit uh, of adjustments. And so uh, some of the areas where we've had woven wire fence uh, and we needed to add a little bit of, of strength to that fence uh, is we've put some offsets in uh, off of that fence uh, so that we can allow a hotline to run around that perimeter. And that just kind of, you know, gives that animal a little bit of a shock to keep them off and not pressure that, that permanent fence that may not be in the best shape. Uh, but in, also it helps us to, uh, to provide some type of electric current to then attach to our temporary fencing. Uh, I always recommend to, to producers to make sure that your perimeter fence is very strong. Um, and then all the stuff in the middle can be flexible, especially if we're starting to do rotational systems and we're looking at different forages because having the ability to adjust your paddock size based on the number of animals or the active uh, growth of your forage uh, is a lot easier to do with temporary technology than when you have uh, permanent fencing everywhere. It also gets a lot more expensive when you're putting in permanent uh, splits everywhere. All right, so we're gonna look again, here's our, our common uh, fence. So if you were gonna go um, to the local uh, co-op and buy products to, uh, to build a fence, you're probably looking at getting some um, wooden post, uh, some painted T post, and then some kind of wire source, a woven wire, barbed wire, or a smooth wire technology. Uh, what I would like to, uh, to show us though, is that there's some new fencing technologies that are available um, that may, you may not get at your co-op uh, that you know, we have actually installed here um, in Tipton so that people can see that there are some other options out there. And I don't know if you know, it's personal opinion as to what's better or worse, but it's good, always good to know what, what new is coming down the pipeline. So one option that we've installed is the SunGuard fiberglass post with pre-drilled holes. You can see here, you can also get clips to put on, uh, but it has a pre-drilled hole. You can run your smooth wire right through the, uh, through the post. Uh, this is fiberglass, so I would recommend um, wearing gloves. Ask me how I know. Uh, that's a hard lesson to learn multiple times sometimes. Um, but the good benefit of this is that you have flexibility on the height of where you want to put, uh, put your, <coughs> excuse me, your fence. Uh, if you have a calf or if you're working with small ruminants, you can add, a, a, you know, can strengthen by adding more fence lines at the bottom of this fence post. Um, and this fence does not require an insulator. Uh, in fact, the, the four technologies I'm going to show you, the post itself kind of serves as an insulator because they aren't conductors of electric current. And so you don't have to worry about uh, the post touching the, like the, they would the metal T-post and then grounding themselves out. Um, the next option we have is the Pasture Pro composite post. Again, this is a wood plastic composite. It's pretty close looking to the, uh, the uh, SunGuard fiberglass post. With this one, though, you drill in the hole instead of um, having the pre-drill holes. So you determine the height that you want it. Uh, you use a little clip and you just drill it and, and put your, put your uh, wire through and, and you're good to go on those. Uh, this one's a very interesting post. It's a new product from Gallagher. It's called the Insul Insulated Flexible Line Post. And it's a little bit different in that it doesn't have pre-drilled holes, but it does have sections here. It's hard to see on this picture, uh, but there's a uh, little two little sections all the way through going down through the post. It also has a flexible area in the bottom. So all of these posts have a little bit of flex to them. Uh, but this one, you can go up and you can actually push and pull on it. And it really, that the whole fence will flex, uh, which tends to be a problem um, with some of our other fencing. And we see that problem significantly down here with wildlife. So having a little bit of flex in that fence helps for it not to just completely destroy the fence. You also see these orange clips that they have on these fence posts. Uh, and these orange clips allows for the option of changing the height of the post at any point. So you could, if you decide that you're 
fence was too high or too low, you could pop it off and go ahead and move it and not have to add another line to uh, kind of make up for that area where you put that in there. Uh, also the negative is that these will pop off. So sometimes if we have a deer or something run through the fence, We'll see an area where the fence is kind of saggy, uh, but that's a lot easier uh, to fix than uh, some of the situations we've had when a deer completely ran through and the fence was so tight that it, it just tears it up significantly. Whoop. All right, so another fence post that we put in uh, uh, quite a bit of this fence, and all of these are at the same location in Tipton, Georgia, uh, but this is the timeless fence post. It's by Plastic Innovations. Uh, it's a PVC uh, fence post. It's actually made out of recycled window panes, uh, and we find that a lot of uh, a lot of people are starting to to gain interest in these fence posts. Uh, you know, we th we just thought they were different, and, and we check them out and try them, and we've been pretty pleased with them. Uh, they also have the same flex uh, as that Gallagher post. You can lean on the fence. Not that I would suggest it when it's hot, uh, but you can lean on the fence. Uh, we actually ran over one with the truck. Uh, just because somebody said it would pop up it, and we learned if you hit the truck center, it works. Don't hit it with the tire. I uh, don't want people running over their fence, but I don't know. Boys will be boys, I guess. So the thing about this fence, again, it has the pre-drilled holes. Uh, we see that a lot of our small ruminant producers tend to like this type of fence. Um, unlike the woven wire where we see that goats tend to climb the woven wire, uh, with this being a hot fence that keeps them off of it, but it also allows you to put as many lines at the bottom uh, as you would like to put. Uh, this particular uh, company as well also makes corners or these are what we call A-frame. And we really have liked having these installed uh, at the research station uh, as well. It provides a good, easy corner option. It's a pretty easy installation. And the biggest benefit we've seen to these, uh, to these T-posts is so I had a team of all girls the first summer that we installed this uh, and they they never put any of these T-posts in the ground and within an hour they had 19 posts in the ground uh, like it was nothing. Um, start to finish just continue just it's a very very easy installation. Uh, now we do have very sandy soils down here so that does uh, help that but for this all we had to do was take a drill with an auger bit uh, and drill us a little bit of hole and there is a point on the end of that post and it's uh, it's a really easy installation so we've been really happy with this uh, this particular product now the number one complaint or, or uh, discussion that I have with producers when we talk about uh, implementing managed grazing especially if they um, are managing their farm from a distance is not having electricity and so how do we uh, incorporate grazing uh, technology or utilizing any of these uh, temporary fencing because if it's not hot it's not going to be effective uh, and you know they've made some really significant advances uh, in electricity and and solar uh, solar energizers and so now uh, you know if we have a good sunny spot uh, you know they've really improved the development of these energizers to where they can uh, power a significant amount of fence and so it's a good technology and it's a good option uh, when running electricity, obviously, is not going to be an option on a lot of our land. And so I've mentioned temporary fencing a, a lot. Uh, there's a lot of great benefits to uh, temporary fencing technology, and we'll go through what some of those uh, specific technologies are in just a little bit. Uh, but it really is going to help us to maximize our grazing efficiency and utilize uh, that forage material that's out there. It's also going to allow us to graze in areas where, um, you know, putting in a permanent fence is really just not a feasible option. And so now you can create a little bit of a perimeter for a short period of time and you start to effectively graze some areas that you just kind of left alone because you couldn't uh, confine that area. Uh, it also can help you for creating lanes and moving cattle or, uh, you know, just uh, encouraging them to, to move to other areas because now you are limiting their space. Uh, so you're kind of forcing them to graze some of those areas that they may look over in a continuous grazing situation. And it allows for a lot of flexibility. Uh, so you can put, in, put up as much or as little temporary fencing as you would like to, depending on your labor level or your, uh, your schedule or, you know, your comfort with it. Uh, but it, it's really, uh, it's really user friendly. And so it's also easy, fast and much more economical uh, than buying a lot of permanent uh, fence posts. And so 
Uh, really, when I, we talk to new producers that are getting into beef cattle production and grazing management, we're going to recommend uh, getting a good energizer and going the temporary route uh, for a period of time before you put in permanent, because uh, it's a lot easier to move a temporary fence until you figure out where those, uh, where you continue to put that same fence over and over. Um, another limitation that we hear a lot about, especially from a rotational grazing standpoint, is water and how do we get uh, water into certain locations. And so uh, this is the Quick Connect system. And we've used this now in two different ways uh, for temporary grazing uh, um, operations that we've had here uh, on the campus. And so this is a temporary uh, line that we installed for just a three-year project. Uh, we knew kind of where our splits were going to be. And so we put these Quick Connects uh, on this tube line, um, and then it just has a connect on the other, connection on the other side um, that you click into that that water line, and then you have active water uh, within that that particular system. And we did we got these from Ken Cove. If anybody's looking for those, um, and then when we were building our permanent grazing uh, areas where we had the, all those those different posts that we were talking about. We went ahead while we were putting our permanent water systems in and we added a, a spigot right next to it. And so with that, we're able to add water hose um, so that we can then run temporary lines or temporary waters off of that spigot because it's a lot easier to do that than it is to try to figure out a way to connect it directly to a permanent watering source. And so just having a spigot around uh, can really be uh, beneficial um, if you're installing any new waters, think about adding that to that uh, technology as well. Um, we've also uh, been fortunate enough to test out some different newer technologies uh, of, on the water, temporary watering side. Uh, and so this blue water here that's up on a sled, we actually pulled these out of an old uh, feedlot facility that we had here on the campus, retrofitted them to some sleds. Uh, and then we put a hose. It has, if you see that blue lid there, uh, it has that quick connect on the other side of it. And here it is connected on this um, Richie water that you can see. Uh, and so it connects right in and connects to that water hose. And so we have these that we can move around. Now these are pretty heavy. And so we have to pull them around uh, with a gator, or some kind of ATV. Pasture forage. Um, on this side, and even the one down here at the bottom, uh, this is a Richie well. Uh, and it's actually very lightweight. I was very impressed. Uh, the first time my technician, we went out to move it, she just grabs it with one arm and tosses it in the back of the ATV. And I was like, wow, you've been working out. Uh, but it's a lot easier because you can just flip it over, dump that water out. Again, a hose and a quick connect system. And then this is a ball water we're actually actively using oh, right now, uh, grazing some annual ryegrass uh, in areas of our farm that we haven't grazed before. And so we've able to, again, put a long water hose, attach this to a spigot, uh, and put this ball water out here and, and easily provide enough water for our animals. So uh, there is new technology that's in, yeah. improving the flexibility of uh, some of these we'll grazing, of uh, management okay. grazing techniques that we're, we're talking about implementing. So that really helps. Mm -hmm. So a few tools of the trade when it comes to our temporary fencing, uh, we're going to go through. There's all kinds of fence posts, all right? There's lots of them, no matter what store you go into. Uh, and really, the best one is a personal preference. Um, everybody has a different thing um, that they like. Some people enjoy the type here that have multiple clips because it gives you a lot of flexibility to adjust the height uh, of, your, of your fence, depending on what you're trying to keep in or keep out or how tall your forage might be so we're not shorting out uh, based on that forage growth material. Uh, this one, again, is... Um, a fiberglass option. So as this one starts to weather and splinter, it does uh, get in your hands a little bit more, uh, but it has a few clip areas. Uh, and then we have the curly Q post and the curly Q really just has that one option. Uh, I think Gallagher now makes this one. It's got a, a loop and it's a flat side rather than uh, having the pigtail stick out. Um, but even though you just have the one option at the top, um, you can add an insulator to that to give yourself uh, another option there. So you could at least have two lines on that, uh, on that particular one. And we have all kinds of these that we use at the research station. And I think every one of us has a different one that we like for whatever reason. I know for me, it's, it's whichever one I can get to step in the easiest 
uh, with my small feet. So it, that, you know, maybe not everybody has that challenge. Uh, the thing about the pig toes, uh, pigtails, though, is they're also uh, multifunctional. Uh, so my mom actually used this as a wedding decoration at my wedding. And so it actually, you can, you know, if you're looking to have a good reason and you have a family member that's having a celebration, well, you can tell them that you're going to buy the post to hang up signs at the celebration. And then you can just take those on home and use those for grazing and maybe get a little bit of buy-in by somebody else. Um, with all of these, we definitely need to uh, have an energizer. You need to have an electric option. Uh, you don't have to go buy the most expensive thing off the shelf. There's lots of options out there now. Uh, there are battery options, solar battery, and straight solar options. Uh, the larger one I showed earlier in the presentation uh, is definitely a large solar panel with a marine battery. Um, and it uh, lasts for a very long time and it provides a lot of power and a lot of electricity. Uh, if you're looking for something more short term, there are smaller options, uh, but we do need to remember that it's all electric and so everything needs to be ground properly. Uh, our biggest, uh, I guess, faults in a, a good um, fencing system is not having proper, uh, proper grounding on those energizers. So we do need to make sure that we are proper grounding, like grounding these systems. There's also a lot of options out there, tape and wire or even rope. Uh, we actually use all three of these as well at the research station. And again, a lot of this comes down to personal preference. Um, when it comes to patching a lot of the tape and the wire, um, it tends to be that uh, it's easier to tie the tape back together uh, but it's also easier to break. There's a lot of smaller um, little wires in there. And so the more you use this, the more you're going to tend to see those breaks and you're going to lose some of that conductivity in that. You see that a little bit less uh, with the wire. Uh, I think the majority of uh, people tend to go towards the turbo wire. It's, um, I think it's either a Gallagher or True Test product, uh, but people tend to like that one. Uh, the most, but you know, we use all of them. Uh, the only caveat, um, and this is actually from my farm way back, I saw these pictures from my dad a few years ago, uh, but it really doesn't matter what you use, they all can be effective. And uh, this is a picture of uh, the white tape, and this is the wire uh, with the curly cue. And then this is a personal lesson from our family farm. Um, so, whatever you choose, tape or wire, make sure you can see it as well as your cattle can see it. And so I grew up on an Angus farm um, and imagine that this, this is actually, if you can barely see it, it's red and uh, or it's black and yellow wire. And um, we have Angus cattle and we would have a hard time seeing this when we were going out, especially when you have cows get out at night or, or one of those problems. So if we can't see it, how do you expect that they're gonna see it and not run through it? And so that was one of those things that we learned. So make sure whatever you choose um, that you can see it and they can see it. Uh, also, it's hard for tractors to see this one, uh, especially when you get into that fall time period. Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, if you're just going out, you're thinking about implementing this, you know, it's, it's a lot. Sometimes it's overwhelming to take it all in. And so we've kind of came through. Uh, and created what we call the starter kit, the grazer starter kit, or a few ideas of things if you just wanted to go out and try this a little bit. Again, you know, just put up one fence. So, you know, go get a packet of posts, uh, you know, somewhere around 25, 15 to 25 posts, depending on the length of your pasture area, it's going to determine how many you, you uh, effectively get. Uh, you don't have to put these as, you know, that close together. It is electric wire. You're going to need some type of poly wire or tape. Um, we would recommend getting a geared reel, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. It just makes life a lot easier for um, rolling this out. Now, putting it out the first time, your tape is, tends to be on a roll, uh, but then trying to take it up and move it around, it's a lot easier if you have one of these reels. Um, a solar charger or some type of energizer to provide electricity. Uh, we also recommend a fault finder. Uh, this just helps uh, whenever you're trying to troubleshoot. And so if we're getting into starting uh, grazing management, having that uh, really slows down a, a lot of those headaches that tend to take a lot of time. And then make sure that you have a grounding rod and you properly ground those energizers. 
Um, the, another tool of the trade uh, that we've learned, and, and especially if you've never used temporary fencing or you've never used electric fencing uh, with your animals, is to create a training area or train your animals to the fence. And we do this before we uh, implement grazing studies uh, because a lot of my studies are with uh, weaned calves or young calves that are coming off, uh, off their moms. Uh, and so they may not have been behind a temporary fence at this point in their life. And so what we do is we just set up a short run of fence uh, of our, our temporary fence. Uh, we put as a solar energizer some way to make it hot. And we have them within a paddock where they're normally grazing or they're used to being in that paddock. And, you know, curiosity being what it is, uh, they will come up and they will test that fence. <laughs> And this was within, this wasn't that long after we, we put that in. Okay, so they'll test the fence and then they'll learn and they'll get that shocking experience. Um, and so it, it helps you to also practice uh, putting this up and maybe seeing if you're getting it hot enough or, or how you're wanting to set up this system. Uh, but after you leave that there for a few days, uh, you'll notice that they just kind of stay away from it. Uh, they don't bother it. Uh, and we've actually set up a completely temporary uh, grazing area for a lot of our calves and not had issues after they've gone through this training. Now, multiple times I've had uh, producers call me after they've set up their perfect area and they went and they let their animals out and their animals had never been to that farm and never been behind temporary fence and they went all over the place. So make sure that you've exposed them uh, to this fencing a little bit. A few other helpful tools uh, we find are having a hammer and a drill with an auger bit if you're going to install some of these newer uh, post technologies. Um, having T-post or solid post for your corners in temporary, um, in temporary grazing. So, you know, it's great to have your temporary post, but have something pretty solid for those turns and those corners uh, so that it can pull on that uh, will really help because those posts, as you um, continue to get that fence on there tight will start to bend. And so you want to have something pretty solid there. Uh, and then here in the bottom, I have some geared reels and you can also see uh, this is just, we were setting up some systems. So this is what we typically have when we go out to set up our systems uh, for rotational grazing. And a lot of those are different types of geared reels, which just help with, uh, with uh, I guess, rolling it up and moving it uh, a lot. Um, some other technologies that we recommend, um, having a grazing stick. So, you know, if you're trying to decide how much area and you, you know you need to have two to three days worth of material, well, how do you calculate that? Uh, and having a grazing stick and actually going out and measuring that forage is a good way to start to make those estimates for what uh, the area needs to be. Um, a new tool that we found uh, out of necessity this past year as we were uh, strip grazing um, a lot of our alfalfa Bermuda grass and we were moving every two to three days, but our runs were way less than 300 feet. Okay, so our big huge reels, which we like for long runs, really weren't that effective. And so we found these little tiny reels. Uh, Google was an amazing friend for us there. And so these reels are really effective at doing short runs and you, it just hangs right there. Uh, so it's still, um, this particular one's not hot on this end, it's hot from the handle end, uh, but it can hang directly on the fence and you can just pull that run there. So these mini reels have been really uh, beneficial for us for quick moves uh, throughout the field. And if it all seems to be too much, just start with one fence. Uh, you know, and we have systems that can be very complex looking, um, but when it really gets down to it, go out there, put one fence up, Move the cattle from side to side and see if you start to see a difference in your forages and your animal performance. And it's, it's a really telling sign and a really good visual uh, when you start to see that yourself. And also remember that no matter where you're at today, if you just implement one new thing, that by the end of the year, you're going to be a better grazer uh, than you were before. So it doesn't take going and doing all of this stuff at once and just um, you know, trying to implement way too many things, you know, just, just one thing can really help to improve uh, that beef management and that grazing management. Um, now, I know I've shown you a lot of different technology. I do want to highlight that we have the fencing and water system demonstration area 
as part of our Better Grazing program in Tifton. Uh, this is on the, the UGA Tifton campus at what we now call the Better Grazing program. Uh, we have all of the fencing installed that I talked about. We have the Energizer uh, that's utilized. Um, you know, it, it helps our, it keeps our exterior fence. Uh, and we have different types of waters, both temporary and permanent. And I tell you this because we've created this as an area for producers, for extension agent trainings, industry meetings, uh, for people to come and see some of these technologies in action. Uh, because one of our biggest downfalls is we talk about all of these technologies, uh, but nobody can actually go and see them. And so I wanted to create an area where we can do that. And so we do have this uh, at the UGA Tifton campus. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without a lot of our sponsorships. And so we have had a lot of sponsors that have helped us with that. And we would like to thank them for that. Uh, but I welcome anybody that would like to come down and, and see this, or if you all want to develop a trip or something of that nature, we could definitely uh, work something like that out because we love to, to show, this, uh, show this around now that we've gotten it developed. And with that, I will take any questions. Uh, I just want to know how can we visit the... Um... The fencing. I want to see some of the uh, temporary fencing in uh, in place before I go ahead and buy some of those posts. Can I do I set up an appointment or can I just drive down during normal business hours? Um, so uh, right now we don't have all the temporary hooked up uh, in about a month or so. We will have them all installed. Uh, we'll be starting to graze again. Uh, we have an active research project there. And so uh, if you drove down, there would be a chance at that point that you may or may not catch us. Um, you can uh, send me an email. We can set up a time if you want to just come down and visit. Uh, and if I'm not available, my technician or my student, uh, my graduate student would be glad to, to meet with anybody. They spend a significant amount of time over there right now. So, Okay, I'll send that to you this evening. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Do you uh, have any comparative prices? Permanent fencing and cross fencing costs per foot or something like that? Um, so I don't have the most current pricing. I know that a lot of material prices have changed recently uh, just with shipping costs and a lot of those things. Um, when we actually installed the, uh, the majority of our permanent with the uh, timeless fence, I compared that with woven wire and, um, and um, wooden post, uh, and it was significantly uh, less to go that route, which I was surprised about. It's pretty comparable to a painted T-post um, hot wire or smooth wire uh, cost, but I can look those up. I just have, I don't have them right offhand. This is uh, James Ford. Do you have a uh, formula for rotation of grazing or do you just use it uh, kind of a uh, uh, catch a catch can just see how it works out? Do you have any kind of formula for the, uh, the size of cattle, uh, uh, the amount of the, the paddocks, anything like that? Uh, yes, actually, we have a, a spreadsheet that we use, um, and I have uh, some information that, that I've given out to the county agents to where they can help to calculate that, um, and all that information is also, it's comprised from Southern Forages, if you happen to have that book. Um, I don't have it with me right offhand. Uh, if you shoot me an email, I can send you that information, um, but getting started, a lot of uh, what we tell a lot of people is uh, use the take half, leave half method. Uh, and so you go out and you graze and say you have uh, 14 inches of material, you knock off seven inches and then you continue to move forward. We usually target three to four inch height left in the field. Uh, but if we tell people to shoot for three to four inches, then a lot of times when they first get started, they get below that before they move. And so you don't see that regrowth benefit. And so there's lots of, I guess, rules of thumb. Uh, but if you want the specific um, calculations and, and those estimates, uh, you can email me at jjtucker at uga.edu and I can send that to you. While I'm here, another thing that you didn't mention, what about the benefits of the droppings that uh, cattle drop while they're in the rotational grazing? Oh, yes, it's, it's quite beneficial. We're actually seeing some of that benefit in a project that we have right now where we're doing uh, hay or baleage production right next to rotational grazing. Uh, and it's really neat to be able to see uh, in some of the areas where um, we had higher stocking, so we had higher output uh, in that area. Um, and so, yeah, there's great benefit because uh, you do spread those nutrients around uh, versus in a continuous system, those animals... Uh, tend to congregate under the tree or in certain areas. And so you have nutrient 
uh, high loads or deposits in those areas compared to spreading it throughout the field uh, for better forage uh, fertilization. That's an excellent point. My question is around forage and the uh, different types of forages that you can use for uh, different nutritional values within a grass. So are you wanting to know what's, what the difference is quality-wise or? Uh, is that a good way of doing planting uh, different uh, types of grasses within a, a paddock? So we see a, a lot of benefit from both monocultures as well as polycultures. Um, and so if you have multiple grasses and legumes or, or mixtures, um, the, the new rule of thumb, I guess, is to have active roots. And as long as you have active roots in the field, um, you're seeing greater benefit uh, of in, the, in the unit, the production unit of that, that land. Um, if we're looking at ranking forages by quality, uh, you, your first are going to be your legumes, your annual legumes, then your annual grasses, uh, cool season annual grasses. Um, so um, annual ryegrass, things of that nature are going to be higher quality than your summer annual grasses. Then you move into your perennial grasses. So your tall fescue, cool season tall fescue is going to be higher quality than your warm season perennial, which would be the hayagrass or Bermuda grass. Uh, and so that's a uh, pretty standard um, on the quality rank. Uh, and so what we like to see is a good mixture. Uh, down here, we don't have a lot of cool season perennial grasses, uh, but we do have a lot of fields that have Bermuda grass or Bahia grass that we can also add clover and annual ryegrass to. And so we start to see that mixture of quality as well as uh, quantity of forage available for grazing for an extended period of time. Okay, thank you. One more question. Uh, in, in your rotational grazing, or as you move from paddock to paddock, is there a big need for high-used high areas? So you would see a less, less of that. Uh, we actually see, uh, I know everybody's had really wet, uh, wet years, uh, essentially across the southeast the last couple of years, and this year has been just crazy. <laughs> For us, uh, but we do see that there is uh, less of that mud factor uh, because you are able to move those animals through. You're keeping more of a cover on there. There is going to be mud just because mud is everywhere right now. Uh, but it, we do see that it decreases that. Uh, if you're rotationally grazing and you're providing hay, you may see an increase in that heavy use area just around that hay product. Uh, what we tend to do is if we're grazing high quality forages, like we had uh, brassicas that we started grazing a few weeks ago. And so we put very low quality hay in there. Uh, that's because they need more of that fiber that that low quality hay is going to give them because those brassicas are so high in protein. We also see that there is the benefit of using temporary fence to create a heavy use area. So if you see that you're starting to have a, a giant mud factor and you don't want to just have your whole pasture or your whole field uh, destroyed with mud, then you can use some of your temporary fencing technology to a limit to where those animals are. And so then maybe you have an area that's impacted that you could go in and overseed with crabgrass or ryegrass or something of that nature uh, as you move the animals out of there. So it can actually be dual benefit both directions. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is Bobby Solomon. I was wondering, I haven't heard you mention pearl millet for like summer grazing. H have y'all tried that? Uh, yes, we've used it. We find that pearl millet, tend, I mean, it, it's a great option for summer grazing. We also use it for hay and baleage production. We actually have leaned more towards crabgrass in, our, in my particular program. Um, and part of that is we're looking at using uh, crabgrass as an option to improve bahia grass quality uh, because the quality of bahia grass is just it can only be so good and it's not that great and crabgrass is actually pretty phenomenal because it's an annual forage so we're mixing them together uh, the other is that in drought situations crabgrass comes up anyway uh, but if we start to watch our animals they actually selectively graze that crabgrass so why not utilize that so that tends to be 
what we lean towards in my particular program. We've had lots of producers that effectively graze pearl millet uh, or pearl millet and, and mi- within a mixture. Um, I just haven't used it a lot recently. Okay, thanks. Why do you ask that question? What about native grasses? I, <laughs> so I have some experience with native grasses. I actually grew it uh, when I was over in Alabama, um, over near Selma at the uh, Black Belt Research Station there. Uh, we have a mixture of uh, Indian grass, big blue stem and little blue stem. Uh, it's kind of the recommendation that came out of Tennessee and we've put it in several places across the Southeast. Uh, I'm a big proponent of uh, native warm season grasses. They're a good forage option, uh, drought tolerant, Uh, You have to graze them differently. You can't graze them as low as you can bahia grass and Bermuda grass. And really our biggest challenge I found down here is um, when we try to establish it, common Bermuda grass takes it over. Um, And it takes two to three years to get a native warm season effectively established. Uh, Now, if you have a native warm season, I say keep it and use it. Um, We actually utilize Eastern Gamma grass on my home farm. Um, and we call it uh, ice cream grass because uh, they, they love it in the middle of the summer and they just gain like gangbusters on it. Uh, but getting it established is the biggest challenge to our native grasses. Dr. Tucker, while you are on uh, the Zoom conference, uh, could you give the audience uh, some information on uh, for those that may want to get them a grazing stick where they could get one? So actually, currently, I don't have one. Um, We usually get those out at the um, grazing schools, uh, and that's through NRCS. They actually are the ones that provide those. Uh, But since we haven't been able to have a grazing school because of COVID, (laughs) I don't really know uh, if they have those, where they have those currently available. Um, But I can look into that. I can call our grazing specialist, uh, our our, our NRCS grazing specialist, uh, Philip Brown, and see if they happen to have any uh, on on hand or any specific particular NRCS offices uh, throughout the state. That's a good question. I'd like to get some more. (laughs) This is James Ford. Again, I don't want to dominate it, but you mentioned the NRCS and uh, rotational grazing, cross Mm -hmm. fencing, um, watering facilities, uh, heavy use areas, uh, I would just encourage people if they're gonna get into rotation of grazing, be sure to check and see if you have some, get some assistance for those practices, uh, especially like the rotation of grazing, uh, water facilities, uh, heavy use areas. So they'll, they'll be real beneficial if you just getting started with the rotation of grazing. Yes, Dr. Tucker, this is um, Handy Kennedy. What are your thoughts on aerating your pasture um, um, once a year? Is that a common practice? Is that something we need to incorporate when I say aerating your pasture? Um, typically, uh, aeration is it's a common question uh, that we get, but we actually don't see that much benefit from it. Um, a few years ago, we'd gotten this question a lot. Uh, and so I started looking at, into the research uh, just to make sure that you know we weren't off base, that there might be something else out there. Um, There are producers that aerate annually and feel that they see the greatest benefit, Uh, but from a research standpoint, the data does not show uh, that there is a lot of benefit. Now, you can go out and test your soils and see if you have a compacted soil or a hard pan, Uh, and so that might be an opportunity to uh, look at how you can address that, Uh, but if you don't see those issues, uh, you're not going to see that positive benefit um, from aeration that you would expect to see. Uh, so we, we really don't, and even in uh, Bermuda grass, uh, I, you would expect that more people would aerate Bermuda grass maybe than they would tall fescue. Um, and, and still, we don't really see that. It's really where we see a hard pan situation or a lot of compaction uh, that it, it's, po- it's, I guess, providing any positive benefit. Uh, so economically, it doesn't really uh, pan out for the numbers. So um, in your opinion, would there be any grazing management techniques that uh, folks in these other states would have to be aware of or cautious of uh, that you know of? They're primarily uh, still in the the southern United States for the most part. I would 
would say that most grazing management techniques are, are pretty uniform uh, and universal. Uh, you can use them across any forage species. Uh, I, the greatest challenge would probably be if we got out into the rangelands of Texas. Uh, and that's just because your acreage that you're working with there becomes astronomically different. Uh, you know, we're able to uh, average or estimate um, two and a half acres per cow-calf pair in the southeast, and that's just unheard of in, in rangelands. But uh, I would say as long as you're within the southeast area, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the land may change, but the information is still the same. Hey, Dr. Tucker, I have one more question. Um, pertaining to your farm test sites, are that only done at y'all campuses like Tipton? Do y'all actually go out to some of the producers and turn some of those producer farms into like test sites? Um, so last year we actually were working on an opportunity to have, uh, we were going to have an on, um, on farm uh, fencing field day. Um, and then we also had um, some on farm trainings that we were going to put on for producers and extension agents to utilize some temporary fencing technology. Um, and uh, COVID canceled that. And so we are very hopeful that uh, once we do get extension directives that we can uh, open those kind of programs back up that we definitely want to uh, implement some more of that. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you too, Dr. Tucker. So with that, everyone, uh, thank you. Good night. Uh, wish everyone a, a, a nice uh, evening and uh, take care and be safe.